Um, again, my, good afternoon. My name is John Dalmas, and I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Chemistry Council. On behalf of my members, I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today, along with my colleague, uh, Prapti Muhuri from the American Chemistry Council, who, I, as I mentioned, will be joining us over Zoom. Um, MCC and ACC companies support the 90, more than 90,000 Michigan jobs and generate $370 million in state and local taxes. But the most important figure, I think, for these purposes is that 96% of all manufactured goods are touched by chemistry. So our industry touches anything and everything, and we are essential to every facet of Michigan's economy. And a major focus for us is sustainability, materials management, recycling, and in particular, plastics. So I have with us here um, some show and tell that I brought from my personal recycling bin and my pantry. And I'll go through all these uh, very deliberately. Sustainability and achieving a circular economy, again, are an important issue for us. Uh, at their own plants, our companies where they manufacture things, including in Michigan, they are leaders on things like energy efficiency, water efficiency, zero waste, and processing manufacturing by byproducts for different uses. And this particular slide is a very important one. As you look at sustainability, this is called the materials management hierarchy. And it goes from most preferable, number one, reduce, all the way to least preferable, number five, which would be landfill. And as stated, chemistry is part of the production of so many materials for consumer goods. And so our industry cares a lot about maximizing the sustainability of these materials, particularly plastics. And they do this in conjunction with governments and other stakeholders, why we're so eager to be in front of you today. Our plastics members have made significant goals to advance the recyclability of their materials. And they're responding because their customers, um, people like Coca-Cola or Meyer, or uh, Yoplait, Pepsi, even Walmart are demanding this. Uh, it's, a, it's a business imperative. At their nature, I will say that plastics help achieve sustainable outcomes by reducing, number one, uh, the impacts of materials used. And uh, they do more with less, and they also help in many ways to extend the sustainability of food in packaging. If you look here, these are, you may wonder why, again, cucumbers are wrapped in plastic, uh, oftentimes at your grocery store. Um, most importantly, beef, steak, meat, um, the shelf life of that is extended extremely uh, on a significant basis because of the use of those uh, plastic packaging. And uh, that cut of meat that's in your grocer's uh, freezer, a, a lot of resources have gone into that. And to throw it away before it even can make it to your home is obviously um, undesirable on many levels. This is another example of um, a lot of type of, of common foods, a lot of packaging that is used to help extend the sustainability, extend the, the uh, usable life of those products, and uh, pretty significant reduction in food waste. Further, when compared to many other alternative materials, it would be a mistake you know, to move from plastics um, to some of these other things like steel, aluminum, or glass, because they have a, a much greater environmental impact. Plastics do more with less, and that's why so much packaging has shifted this way. Uh, the materials I brought in today, this whole bag weighed only a few grams uh, when empty. Uh, the packaging itself takes a very little space, very little weight, and it does the job. But we want to enhance their ability to be recycled. So that's why we're here to talk to you today about increasing that recycling. And there are many challenges indeed. These include diverse materials. Um, New materials like flexible packaging have become very common. As a father of two little ones, we use these little baby food pouches, apple sauce pouches all the time. Um, and they are excellent in many ways, but they cannot be easily recycled. Consumer behavior is probably, uh, changing human nature again, probably the most challenging thing because you've got people who dispose of things inappropriately, obviously just littering out in the environment. None of us, I don't think, condone that. None of us would probably do that ourselves, but you see it everywhere you go. And how to address that, um, that's been a, a problem for some time, and it's going to take a lot of work. That also would include people that try to recycle products that shouldn't be recycled. And uh, around our state, you've got loads of recycling that are contaminated when people put things in the bin that shouldn't even be there. It can be dangerous, it can soil the load, and it can uh, really reduce the value, ultimately, of what we try to recycle. This legislation gets to that and tries to address one of that issue. Recycling access is a huge thing, again, that this legislation tries to address. Um, even if you have access to curbside recycling, people only place about 40% of the recyclables into the bin. 
unfortunately, and the remaining 60% of the material goes to the landfill. Um, making sure that people have that access is the first step. We have a lot of infrastructure gaps in our state, places where people don't have curbside recycling, don't even have uh, easy drop-off access in their community, and uh, we don't have those systems in place. The last two things are very uh, interrelated, and that's economics and market demand. Uh, we can talk about recycling all you want, but if uh, there's no market for it. If it costs too much, uh, it's not going to work. Recent restrictions from China have had a major impact on our ability to recycle in the U.S. There are many materials that can still be recycled, uh, for which it just costs more money right now than some are willing to pay. Uh, that would include glass. I think it was brought up last week. Uh, you take in glass, but um, you can't sell it. Hardly you may have to pay to have it sent out and processed. Mixed paper and several types of plastic. And before I turn it over to my colleague, I wanted to just quickly run through the types of plastic that are before we here today. It's going to get to our next point about how we improve the recycling of these plastics. So the first uh, one, number one resin, is PET. And that's the, found in most beverage containers, soft drink uh, water containers, very common packaging for other uses. Number two, and the triangle on the bottom of the package, HDPE, high-density polyethylene. That's very common. Milk jugs is probably... The most ubiquitous example, but if you look across, number ones and number twos are very common. Number three would include PVC, and that's not as often used in food packaging, but sometimes used in what's called multi-layer packages, these flexible pouches, like here it's Craisins. Um, number four is uh, low density uh, or linear uh, polyethylene, LDPE, and that's flexible packaging. So like a plastic bag, but also the wrap around your water, in this case it's Bounty, uh, paper towel, that's LDPE. Number five is polypropylene. That's a rigid plastic that's used in a lot of yogurt containers, uh, butter tubs, things like that. Uh, number six is uh, EPS, extended polystyrene. And so here it's an egg carton. Um, a takeout container is also EPS. Um, company 15 minutes south of here that makes a lot of foam cups and foam packages, employs a lot of people in Mason. So I want to turn it over to my colleague. I want to bring her in on Zoom. Um, and that's Ms. Muhuri from the American Chemistry Council. Thanks, John. Just wanted to confirm that everyone can hear me loud and clear. Welcome. I think, you're good. I think we've got you connected now. Thank you. And thank you, Chairman Howell and members of the committee. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here, uh, although virtually. Uh, my name is Prop Murray, and I'm with the American Chemistry Council's Plastics Division. Uh, the ACC is a national trade association representing both the U.S. chemical industry, including the leading manufacturers of plastic resins. And in 2018, America's plastic makers announced their circular economy goals to reuse, recycle, and recover 100% of U.S. plastics packaging by 2040. And so this is where new innovations like advanced recycling, also known as chemical recycling, will be really instrumental, not only for America's plastic makers to achieve their goals, but also for the state of Michigan uh, to reach its goal of a 45% recycling rate by 2030. So on the next slide, I'd like to simply break down what advanced recycling is. Uh, advanced recycling involves various innovative processes in which post-use plastics are transformed into a variety of products, plastic and chemical feedstocks, specialty chemicals, and other useful products like waxes and transportation fuels. More specifically, going to the next slide, technologies such as paralysis and gasification don't combust or burn plastics, but rather they heat and vaporize the plastics in an oxygen-starved environment, which is what you're seeing as step two on this slide. And then these vapors are then cooled into liquid hydrocarbons, which can be processed into that versatile mix of outputs I just mentioned, plastic feedstocks, chemicals, waxes, fuels, et cetera. I'd like to highlight that advanced recycling has a lot of advantages in that it can process a heterogeneous mix of plastic resins, as well as plastics in rigid foam and flexible form. So when John went through the extensive list of, of plastic resin codes. Uh, additionally, these technologies can produce plastic and chemical feedstocks with performance that are equal to virgin plastic and chemicals. So in this next slide, I'd like to share a case example of a company that's doing just that. So commercialization of these technologies have really begun to accelerate in recent years, um, including some of Michigan's neighboring states like Indiana. So 
There's a California-based company called Brightmark, and they're currently constructing a $260 million facility um, at 112 square feet in Ashley, Indiana. So once operational in 2021, uh, Brightmark expects to be able to convert 100,000 tons of post-use plastics into about 18 million gallons of uh, ultra-low sulfur diesel and naphtha, which can be used to make new plastics, as well as about 6 million gallons of commercial grade wax that can be used for things like crayons. Uh, Brightmark is also planning to employ 136 full-time manufacturing jobs to run the facility once it's operational. So going into this next slide, which I think is super critical to see, if Michigan became a hub for advanced recycling technologies and converted just 25% of the currently landfill plastic feedstock in the state, it could generate $349 million in economic output each year. And these are post-use plastics that could otherwise be landfilled. Switching to the next slide, please. As John touched on earlier, China's restrictions have really caused a, a short-term disruption throughout the country, including the state of Michigan. But in just the last couple of years, the private sector has announced $5 billion in investments to modernize plastics recycling in the US. 80% of that was for advanced recycling investments. We really believe that these investments support our view that the new materials economy has a very bright future, especially driven by China's action and rapidly growing societal interest in building more circular system supply chains. Finally, if we could kindly go to the next slide, I think it's really critical to uh, recognize the environmental benefits of advanced recycling. These technologies reduce our need for landfilling, thus reusing the valuable plastic resources, while at the same time preserving open space. In fact, the U.S. Department of Energy's uh, Argonne National Lab wrote in a peer-reviewed journal back in 2017 that converting post-use plastics into ultra-low sulfur diesel, uh, like what Brightmark is doing, conserves resources by reducing our fossil energy use by almost 96% and fresh water consumption by up to 58% compared to ultra-low sulfur diesel made from virgin petroleum. So as these technologies are continuing to advance and expand, we expect even greater environmental benefits. So how can good policy help the state of Michigan achieve its mission to increase recycling, conserve resources, and reduce plastic waste? We really want to encourage policymakers to ensure that advanced recycling facilities, like the one I highlighted earlier, Brightmark, that process post-use plastics into valuable commodity chemical and plastic feedstocks, fuels, and other useful products are regulated like other manufacturing uh, facilities in Michigan. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, John. Thank you, Prabhdi. And um, I, I want to turn and just close with basically uh, our support for the Michigan legislation and touch on sp those specific reasons why. Uh, obviously, there are many components to what I uh, counted as a 238-page legislative package and many different perspectives and, and issues that are involved. Thankfully, there's been a long stakeholder process that has led up to this point. And speaking from my perspective at the Michigan Chemistry Council, I've never been engaged in a legislative process where so many parties had so many opportunities to review and share perspectives. Uh, some would say it was too long and, and this road has, uh, has uh, we should have been here to this point sooner, but here we are and I think it's in a good place. I think everyone would also agree the language is not exactly what any of us would have written. Uh, that's part of the, the, the dialogue and the process to get to that point, but Eagle, I believe fully tried to accommodate everyone's needs and concerns, and I want to commend them for that. Uh, the Michigan Chemistry Council focused on a few areas of priority for us. Um, the legislation emphasizes a sustainable materials management approach that sets a recycling goal for our state, but also encourages state and local planning for how to utilize the materials in other ways, uh, in addition to recycling. It is materials neutral and recognizes that we can improve in many areas. The legislation we don't believe is overly restrictive. It has very few real mandates for recycling, but instead relies on planning, goals, and incentives. And we think it's also adaptive to be useful in many of our state's different geographic regions that you represent. The legislation provides appropriate regulation of various types of facilities without discouraging any one materials utilization process. We believe that this will help encourage innovative technologies or approaches like advanced recycling that was discussed here. And the Michigan Chemistry Council finally recognizes this legislation is not a silver bullet. It cannot by itself help address all the recycling market or economic challenges. I don't believe that, that policy alone can get you there. But it will help bring Michigan up beyond our current dismal state of recycling affairs, and that is an issue that's very important to us. And that's why the Michigan Chemistry Council you know, is supportive. And we, so we do appreciate, appreciate your time. We'd be glad to take any questions. 
on uh, generals or particulars. Thank you. Any questions from committee members? I had a fairly amateurish question. You've uh, shown us these half a dozen or so different kinds of plastic and so on. The process that she was explaining, does that utilize all that material? Propti, did you hear the question? Maybe you can help address it better than I could. Or if you could kindly repeat the question. Uh, Mr. Domus has got a number of different kinds of plastic packaging here in front of him just to kind of show us his examples. I was wondering if all of those kind of things work in the process that you were describing. That's correct. So we know that, um, you know, markets, uh, especially for ones and twos, so your water soda bottles, milk jugs, shampoo bottles are um, widely accepted for uh, mechanical recycling um, and they're really pretty good. However, for uh, your three through seven bales, so the, the rest of the resin codes that John was touching on, um, they're not as cost effective um, to separate. And so advanced recycling technologies really provide a, a potential solution for these materials. But more generally speaking, can accept all of the resins. Very good, thank you. Yeah, my, lay, my layman's view of it uh, more so than, than property is that these kinds, again, can be very traditionally recycled very easily. Basically, they cut them up, melt them down, and remelt them into different forms. Um, and that can be done already pretty successfully. Um, even HDP or, or LDPE, the, the film here, this can be turned into decking, like treks, if you have, or um, those chairs that you sit on that are made of polywood. Um, some of that is already possible. But the other stuff, like the foam, that's where advanced recycling comes in and can hopefully provide a good market for this where it can be worthwhile for people to recycle it and for local communities to have a place to sell it to. So, Very good. Any other questions? I want to thank you for uh, not only your testimony but for your participation in this ongoing process that you described. Uh, I'm impressed by the fact that so many private entities as well as environmental groups, governmental groups, have all worked together to get us to this point. It's a big challenge and uh, you're all to be commended to uh, work this out. So thank, thank you. you for coming. We appreciate the, the opportunity to be part of that and be with you today.